I'm in my office at Cornell in Ithaca, New York. And you are a professor of applied mathematics at Cornell. Yes, that's right. And you're also a writer. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so how do you balance the, the two parts of, of your brain, writing and math? I, I uh, think of myself really primarily as a mathematician and, and as a math teacher. You know, so to the extent that teachers um, are trying to communicate, that feels a lot like writing to me. I first came familiar with your work, not through the equations and that sort of thing, but through your column on, on the New York Times website, uh, The Elements of Math. How did that all come about, and why did you want to take on this project? Uh, well, it was something that I'd wanted to do for years, um, not specifically, I mean, to write for the New York Times, of course, is a dream, but... But to write for the public was something I'd been interested in for a long time. And my first opportunity to do that was in 2003. I wrote a book called Sync. That, that doesn't mean like kitchen sink, like um, being in sync, getting in sync or synchronizing. So anyway, I wrote that book. And as a result of that um, book, I got, well, I had a, a literary agent. And the agent knew the op-ed page editor of the New York Times, David Shipley, who um, came to ask me to write op-eds for him over the years, and so I did a few, and then he said, would you ever have time to write a series about math? He said, how about um, start with preschool? Just take us right through the whole curriculum from kindergarten to, you know, go to long division and then some high school algebra, geometry. Just walk us through all the subjects that we all took, and if you're you know, humanities sort of person, you may not have, or even a science person, you may not have really gotten the first time around. So I have to say, I mean, I'm definitely one of those people that you just mentioned, humanities person who just didn't get it the first time around. I mean, I was okay with math, you know, addition and subtraction, basic math. Sure. When you got to junior high school, pre-algebra, that's really where I started to lose it. And this is a website about place and how writers create a sense of place in their work. Um, and from my own experience of reading your work, you were able to orient me in a place that I was always lost, which, again, is, is math pretty much from junior high school on up. How did you do that, like with Bert and Ernie and that sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, what you're referring to there, in case people haven't uh, seen any of these essays, I, I did have occasion to use a Sesame Street video clip in the first, um, the very first essay of this 15-part series when I was trying to explain what numbers are all about and why they're so useful and what are some of the philosophical mysteries that come up in the very concept of number. You know, we, we think as grown-ups that numbers, are, of course, everyone knows numbers, but when you watch this old video, which I had occasion to do because my kids used to watch, uh, it was called One, Two, Three, Count With Me, and um, there's just this great sequence where Ernie is uh, at a hotel with two other characters, Ingrid and Humphrey are their names, they're, they're uh, working at a hotel, the Hotel Furry Arms, and there's a lunch order that comes in from some penguins up in one of the rooms, and the penguins, you know, as, as this uh, character Humphrey takes their order, he says, what would you like? And the penguins call out, fish, 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 fish. And so anyway, Humphrey says, let me see if I've got that. You know, he's got the phone, fish, 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 fish. <laughs> you know, and it's because he doesn't know the concept of six. The, the point here is that, you know, I tried to, I think empathy is the word we're looking for. When you ask, how do I try to get a, or, or establish a sense of, you said, a, a sense of place, or to find the, the mental place where people are when they hit the wall mathematically, because that's what happens to everybody. It's just a question of where. So for some people, it's, it's somewhere in elementary school. Often long division is the first wall. Other people, the concept of X, you know, what's a variable in algebra, that's abstract, or these word problems about the three guys who can paint three fences in three hours, and how long does it take one guy to paint one fence? You know, that kind of thing. For many people, it's there. Others find it to be calculus. So I become aware, just of talking to friends of mine, it, it comes up. You know, I say I'm a mathematician or a math professor. They say, oh, I was good at math until, and then they tell me where their wall was. So I, I've learned, just by listening over the years, what are the problematic things for most people. Plus, I, you know, honestly, I was never that fast mathematically myself. I found a lot of things hard, but it wasn't really, you know, it's not meant to be remedial. That was the, the interesting thing as far as the challenge. This is not math 2.0 because that wouldn't be fun for anyone. This is really why math is, is so enthralling to the, to the people who love math. Did you learn anything by going back to just 
simple arithmetic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's one of the pleasures for me in trying to compose these columns is that uh, it makes me think very, I don't know, I shouldn't maybe say deeply because that's a little presumptuous, but I have to think very carefully about what, um, what does a person need to know about subtraction? You know, what can you say in 1,500 words? Is there, are there 1,500 words to say about subtraction other than how tricky it is to do borrowing? You know, I don't want to talk about that kind of subtraction. So it's, um, it's a really interesting challenge to think about the fundamentals. And I would say that this is probably true, you know, for writers out there. Think about if you are teaching writing, think of all the things you could say about the fundamentals of writing. Um, where it, like the use of the last sentence in a paragraph to make a zinger or the last word in a sentence or dashes versus semicolons or colons. You know, I mean, if you look at William Zinser's book on writing, he has a whole chapter on punctuation with, with long descriptions of, of what he thinks about dashes versus colons. And um, so anyone who thinks about the fundamentals in their field, it's a refreshing and uh, pleasurable thing. And so, I, yeah, I got, and I did learn a lot actually by thinking about the basics, you know, at the level of arithmetic, but also in, in later subjects, algebra. Or, like if you had to boil down algebra to two things, what was all that about? What are the two big principles of algebra or, or three or whatever? How many are there? And I realized it's all about either solving for X. I mean, it's many variations on there's something, there's a mystery, there's a detective story, there's something mysterious that needs to be unveiled. It's called X. So I don't need to go into the math here, but the point is that, that it's fun to try to distill things. And um, this column or series of columns gave me the chance to do that. Did being a teacher um, and in that way being a storyteller to students, whether it's students at Cornell or the general public who are reading your New York Times column, did that show you that you're a writer or have you been a writer all your life? <laughs> That question makes me embarrassed, honestly, because I don't ever think of myself as a writer. So it's nice that you say that. And I guess I, I'm, it's a question of self-image, right? I mean, people often don't see themselves for what other people see them as. And I, uh, in high school, you know, remember taking English classes and not really knowing what to do. I'd show my, we used to call them themes. I'd give the theme to the teacher each week. And he would usually say, not enough detail. I need more detail. It's not, it's vague. And I didn't know what that meant. What am I supposed to do? And then I finally had one teacher who um, would pretty much rewrite whatever I handed into her. I'd, I'd give her something, and then she would cross stuff out and, and put her suggested revisions. And by seeing very concretely what she had in mind, I, this was the best experience ever in writing. I mean, I was in my junior year in a short story class in high school. I started to understand some of the principles of writing. I want to ask you about one of your other high school teachers, and that was one of your math teachers that you uh, based the book The Calculus of Friendship on. This is a mathematical friendship, and yet you translate it into a book. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? This was a story of a correspondence first. I, I, this teacher, Mr. Joffrey, and I had been writing letters to each other for some 30 years or so. Um, since I graduated, I, I was his student when I was 15. He was 45, you know, now I'm about, well, I'm 51, he's 81. But anyway, through all these years, we've been writing to each other about math problems. That is, he'll show me something that came up in his calculus classes. He's retired now, but when he used to teach, he would often ask me for help. You know, sometimes his better students would ask him things that he didn't know the answer to, and he wondered how I would think about it. So this was really fun for me because I love teaching math, especially, and um, it gave me a chance when I was a grad student and didn't have any students of my own, he became my student. He and, by extension, his students. So this was very thrilling, and I used to write these letters to him about math, and he was happy, I was happy, we did this for years. And um, so I amassed a pretty big collection of letters, and uh, at some point, my wife said, you know, wow, this is really nice. You've been writing to your teacher for 30 years. You, well, it wasn't that, it was maybe 20 years at that point, but anyway, she said, you must know everything about him. And I just said, no, you know, I don't really know anything about him. I just, we just write about calculus problems. The, the point is that Mr. Joffrey and I had this very circumscribed relationship based around math problems. But meanwhile, real life encroached and um, things happened in our lives, including certain tragic things. Like he had a son who died 
quite young. The son was only 27 when he died. And I, I knew this son. He was two years older than I was and went to the same high school. So, you know, at that age, um, I didn't know what to say. What do you say to someone who's a father who's just had a son die? And I never said anything. And he never brought it up in his letters. And as the years went by, I felt increasingly ashamed of myself for not even sending a note of condolence. And, and I also felt like there was something missing in this friendship, that here we were very intimate mathematically but without knowing each other. So it's, the book is a story of this journey, and uh, the, there's a certain poetic element to that because calculus is the study of change, mathematical change. And this is a story of a change, too, but of an emotional transformation in a student's heart, and maybe to some extent in the teacher's heart, too. Can you just talk a little bit more about the parallels that you see as both a writer and as a mathematician in doing each of these things? Are they similar activities in your mind, or are they just completely <laughs> different worlds? There, there are definitely some parallels, that, no pun intended, but I mean, there are things in common, and there are some things that are really different. I, to me, um, the closest similarity is this feeling of problem solving, that when I'm trying to write or find my voice in a particular piece, it's often a problem to figure out what to say and especially what not to say, you know, what to leave out. And so uh, certainly everyone associates math with problem solving. That's not surprising. But, but anyone who's tried writing anything knows that there are huge issues of, of voice, of structure, rhythm. I mean, everything. There's many problems. How does a writer solve them? That's not that different from the challenges a mathematician is facing trying to crack a, a problem that's been handed you know, to you by an equation or an application, some real world setting that has some mathematical dimension to it. But the thing that feels very different between writing and uh, math is that in math, I always have the feeling that there is an answer out there. It, you know, like Plato used to talk about that we can draw a triangle, but that's not the perfect triangle. There's an ideal triangle or an ideal circle. You know, a real line always has some thickness, but the ideal line is infinitesimally thin. And so uh, when you're solving math problems, there's this sense that you only have a certain amount of freedom. You have a freedom in the questions you ask, but the answer is you have no freedom. The answer is what it is. And you may find it or you may not. You also have freedom in how you pursue it. So, so you have limited freedom. The questions you ask, the techniques you use to try to solve the problem, that's where all the creativity is. But there's no creativity in the answer. Um, but that doesn't feel true in writing. I mean, that feels like unbridled creativity from beginning to end, except that there, I guess there are structural things there, too. You could, you know, you're somewhat constrained by, if you're writing a sonnet, there's a limitation. I mean, right, there's, there, are, there are rules or haiku. Um, but still, it feels like there's a little more room for creativity there. I, I, maybe that's not quite the best way to sum it up. I mean, to me, it's a very, almost a... Uh, there's a certain very profound awe that comes in math from this sense that the answer is waiting. But we don't have, we're out there trying to discover the answers and they're waiting for us. That's, that's a feeling I don't have in writing. Is that a good thing? That they're different or that I have it in one case? Well, that, well that, it seems like in a way that, that you have this internal drive to find what the solution is in math. Do you have that same... I need to be writing, I need to be discovering things within the creativity of writing outside of math. The, for me, the, the strongest drive is to, is to explain. Um, and that doesn't, uh, to me, that's not a question of math or writing. I, I like explaining, I like teaching, I like tackling something, whatever it is, with words or numbers, and trying to find the truth. <laughs>